Welcome to the Citrix Clickdown Podcast. We're back with an all-new season of exciting technical Citrix content featuring guest experts on various topics. I'm your host, Steve Beals of Citrix Technical Marketing, and I'm very excited to be starting the third season of the Clickdown. Much like many of our popular streaming shows today, we've taken a bit of a hiatus between seasons, so it's been a while since our last episode. But for season three, we do plan to have several episodes for our listeners as we close out the year. Uh, So be on the lookout for those. But for now, let's kick this season off. So Citrix in 2023 has been focused on investing in hybrid as a destination. And while hybrid solutions are familiar to many of our customers, the way they are being enabled is evolving. And that's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. I've invited Emma Bland from Citrix Product Marketing to join us today. Emma, welcome to the Citrix Clickdown. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. No problem. Glad you're here. So before we dive into our topic on our hybrid conversation, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, maybe your role and your experience while you've been at Citrix? For sure. So I recently transitioned to be a senior product marketing uh, manager in the Citrix BU. Uh, But prior to that, I worked in our Citrix professional services, which is Citrix Consulting, helping our customers uh, design, implement, and assess um, Citrix environments. Good old consulting. Another consulting. <laughs> I, I myself have come from consulting. So there's a lot of consultants without within Citrix uh, departments throughout our business unit. So, uh, so I know that you've recently been working on and publishing a new reference architecture for hybrid cloud, and that's going to be on Citrix Tech Zone. Um, and it's a fantastic read. So my first question today is, is really why should one go hybrid with Citrix? That's a great question. And there's a lot of reasons to go hybrid between CVAT and DAS. So I would say one of the main ones is part of a full transition to Citrix DAS. So in Citrix Consulting, we primarily work with enterprise scale customers. And that means these customers have very large, very mature Citrix environments. And those environments can't simply be flipped over to DAS overnight. So going hybrid between CVAD and DAS allows customers to migrate their workloads in phases and without the end users having to experience too many changes at once. And it also allows IT teams to have more time for testing. So overall, it allows for a smoother transition experience to DAS. I would say uh, another big reason is to gain access to some Citrix cloud services on premises. Um, so we have made some cloud offerings available on-prem. I'm thinking of Web Studio, SPA, and Autoscale are now all available on-prem. However, some other services are not currently available on-premises, such as analytics or global app config service. So if you want to make use of those services that are cloud only, uh, you'll need to go hybrid to access those. Yeah, I know some of those uh, on-prem features were big releases for us this year, and we really put a focus back on some of those on-premises features that were first, you know, delivered in cloud. So that yeah, I know that was exciting for for many of us who've been around Citrix for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. What about uh, you know customers who are looking to maybe go into multiple clouds? What what would be some of the reasons to go uh, go that way? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons for that. I would say the biggest would be kind of business continuity or high availability. Um, If you're utilizing multiple public cloud vendors, you kind of protect and insulate yourself from the risk that so if one of the public cloud vendors goes down, you still have uh, machines and workloads and other clouds for end users to use. Um, Another big one I would say would be kind of like feature and location parity. Um, So different cloud providers have different data centers across the world in different regions. Um, And some specific regions might be better suited for your users, especially if you have to comply with um, data compliance and regulations, as well as some services. So different cloud providers have different kind of services they offer. So some of those services might be suited for your backend applications. And so it's important to take those into account as well. And I would say the big one, especially, is just to avoid vendor lock-in. Um, You don't want to be solely dependent on one specific vendor necessarily. So utilizing multiple public clouds offers you that flexibility as well. Makes sense. You know, and coming from consulting, you know, as you were, you know, talking there, I was thinking like around multiple clouds. Is is there, when you're you're looking at designing an environment for somebody, you know, do do you need Mm -hmm. to look at the environment, you know, if if they're going into Azure and Google Cloud, like does that change your design methodology in any way? Uh, methodology, not necessarily. It does introduce other considerations such as um, basically different cloud providers have the way they operate or some of their 
configurations are slightly different. So you might just have to make some slight adjustments based on whether you're in Azure, AWS, or GCP, um, how things are configured. So there are some changes that might be necessary for that. Um, additionally, we might have different, um, if you're in DAS, different DAS limits uh, for those environments. So there's things to be aware of, but not things that might uh, necessarily require like a re-architecting of the environment in those different public clouds. Okay, that makes sense. And, and what about for any customers that maybe are just starting to look at cloud? I know not every one of our customers is in the cloud today. Um, maybe they're just starting to dip their toe into the water a little bit. You know, how would you advise them to choose a public cloud vendor? Ooh, that's a hard question. <laughs> so there's a lots of things that, that go into that. I would say a lot of that kind of happens maybe more on the business end when it comes to to cost and things of that nature. A lot of the, at least the bigger customers will have surface agreements in place with different public cloud providers that can impact um, kind of where they look to go. And again, I think the biggest thing would be locations and uh, the feature sets in those public clouds. Uh, for example, from a Citrix perspective, um, for example, PVS is currently only available in um, Azure and GCP. So if you're looking to utilize PVS, that's, you're going to want to choose between those two options. It, we are developing it for AWS, but it's not currently released. So again, I think those the, those feature service, those featured services would be kind of the main thing to look at when deciding a public cloud. So many of the decisions our customers need to make when moving to either a hybrid or multi-cloud deployment are really how users are going to access their resources. How should customers go about picking the right access tier? That's a great question. So from the Citrix side, we kind of have two different access tier options. We have our traditional on-premises access tier, which is Storefront and Netscaler, which I'm sure folks are familiar with. And then on the cloud side, we have Workspace and Gateway Service. So there's a couple of key differences between those two. So I think the first big thing to consider is local host cache versus service continuity. So most of our customers are probably familiar with local host cache. It's our on-premises kind of high availability option that kicks in if there's connectivity issues with SQL. However, uh, in the cloud with Workspace, uh, instead of local host cache, you have something called service continuity, um, which is a way to provide access to Citrix Cloud if it's down. The key thing to know is that service continuity does have some specific scenarios it does not support. So you're going to have to look at our product documentation to evaluate whether service continuity supports um, your environment setup. Uh, a key example is currently service continuity does not support kiosks. So if you have a large amount of kiosk users, um, service continuity isn't gonna be the way you wanna go. So definitely check out those product docs and see if your um, configuration is supported uh, by service continuity. And then another major one I would say is authentication options. Uh, so both Workspace and Storefront support um, LDAP, SAML 2.0, and Gateway as IDP. Um, however, Storefront will also support smart, smart card authentication and pass-through authentication. So again, just things to consider there when choosing between an on-premises or a cloud access tier through Citrix. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, service continuity was obviously a pretty big uh, release for us when that came out, I guess, a couple of years now. And I know, you know, we, we continue to, to, you know, only improve on that. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the decisions back when I was in consulting, when cloud first was starting to come out and Citrix Cloud was first introduced, um, were really around keeping the on-premises, you know, access tier because there, there was no high availability within, you know, at that time time, you know, Citrix workspace service. Um, so, you know, that being there now kind of removes a lot of those blockers that maybe customers had seen in the past. So that's, uh, you know, that obviously is something we want to continue uh, working on there. Um, are there any yeah. other key, you know, points or considerations that, you know, as, as customers are, you know, thinking about um, like a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud environment that they should consider? Um, another big one would be, I think I mentioned it before, but the DAS limits. These are just something to be aware of, especially if you have a pretty sizable on-premises environment and you're looking to migrate, especially not just to DAS, but also to public cloud. Um, like I mentioned, we have limits around how many um, VDAs can be in a resource location, how many VDAs can be supported by cloud connectors. So it might just take a little re-architecting of your environment to make sure you're in line with those limits. Um, but those are soft limits and the limits are dynamic. We're consistently working on trying to improve those limits. So always make sure to check out our documentation for the latest and greatest. Um, and I'd say another big one is um, networking, um, how your public clouds are gonna be connected to your on-premises data centers or how you're gonna connect the public cloud. So if you're looking at implementing a fiber connection, um, those can take several months to develop and work with your ISP to get those in place. So definitely recommend uh, considering that sooner rather than later if you're going looking to move to public cloud.
Yeah, I know a lot of those limits. Um, a lot of times are, are not even Citrix limits, right? Sometimes they're they're, they're cloud limits. You know, and I know we work a lot closely with uh, with our partners, you know, in the public cloud arena, on, on you know on those limits. So again, I you know that, that that's something that's constantly being updated, um, constantly being updated, even in our product documentation. So as, as th- you know, customers are looking at it and architecting this, it is something to keep in mind. Um, obviously costs are always a a main point of concern right for customers not only Mm -hmm. when they're you know looking at public cloud when they're looking at citrix um thinking about citrix and you know in a a cloud environment and a multi-cloud environment hybrid cloud environment whatever a customer is looking at what what are the ways that you know customers can actually minimize you know their their cloud costs Uh, does, does citrix come and play there at all for sure, definitely. We have a great feature called Autoscale, which has been available in DAS for a while now, but is now also available on premises in CVAD 2305 and forward. So Autoscale lets you uh, dynamically turn on and off machines based on either schedules or, or user load. And so that can be used to help um, reduce cloud costs by turning off any VDAs that aren't necessary. And those can this auto scale setting can be set by delivery groups as well. So it's pretty customizable. So that's a great way to reduce uh, to reduce costs. And we have some great uh, articles out there kind of um, evaluating the cost savings that you can get with auto scale. Yeah, I think coming, you know, bring, bringing that on to prem is another, you know, another big win, right? Um, you know, customers, I think, who maybe have an on premises environment, but have a cloud resource location, not having that available to them, a lot of times having to do that manually via APIs or PowerShell, like this is all now just within a, a, within the console. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's very easy to set up. So I think that's uh, something really, you know, really to look at and consider. Um, you know, as as customers are, you know, maybe starting their journey, if they're on the journey or maybe they're in the cloud already, are, are there any resources that, you know, you can recommend that, you know, they, you know, they can go and take a look at? For sure. Yeah, we have a lot of great documentation out there. So speaking of uh, de- deciding between an on-premises or cloud Citrix access tier. Um, there's a great blog by Uzair Ali. He's one of our Citrix consulting services architects, and he did a really great blog article about how to choose between a cloud DAS or a CBAT access tier. So and it goes into some different considerations you might want to consider when making that decision. Um, I also love our reference architectures. We have reference architectures available for GCP, AWS, and Azure, which cover um, a lot of great technical content in depth and really touch on kind of all things that are needed in an environment. They include storage, identity, all kinds of stuff like that, some great info. Um, Also, if you're still working on DR design, I really do like our design decision about disaster recovery, which covers a bunch of different DR options that are available and things to consider. And as I mentioned before, our auto scale documentation, we have some great articles out there about cost savings with auto scale. So I recommend checking those out as well. All right. That's great. Yeah, I think, on, on, you know, on our documentation side, especially in uh, in tech zone, which obviously is my, my baby, um, it, you know, we do have a lot of our, our, our reference architectures house there. And, you know, we're, we're working on some new ones as well. Obviously, yours is, you know, coming to be released shortly. So I think that's, uh, you know, a great read for anybody who's, you know, looking to to go into a uh, hybrid situation. Um, but I think, you know, you know, that kind of wraps up things today. Um, you know, I really thank you for joining us today. I think it's a great conversation. Obviously, you know, we're, we're trying just to touch the surface here and, and get people interested in understanding where Citrix can help with the hybrid cloud situation. Um, and again, if you if you haven't read the hybrid cloud reference architecture that Emma has put together, you know, please head over to Citrix Tech Zone, uh, take a look at it, provide any feedback on it. Uh, there's a feedback button right on the article. And you know we're, we welcome your feedback. It would it will go right directly to Emma, so she'll she'll get it, and uh, you know we'll we'll go from there. Um, but you know I appreciate everyone listening, and until next time, you know thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.